Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such the great gift that you have given us in Christ Jesus. That through him, by your grace and your mercy, we are redeemed. Let our hearts be filled with gratitude as we come to your word. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, compel us forward. In Jesus' name, amen. On May 19th, 2000, 40,000 university students gathered for a One Passion conference on a field at Shelby Farms in Tennessee. Pastor John Piper, who is from Minnesota, Minneapolis, he gave the message that day, and although the message was officially titled Boasting in Christ, the beginning of his message was known as Don't Waste Your Life. It's also been called the seven minutes that changed a generation. So he began his message this way. He said, you don't have to know a lot of things in your life to make a lasting difference for the world. But you do have to know the few great things that matter and then be willing to live for them and die for them. The people that make a durable difference in the world are not the people who have mastered many things, but who have been mastered by a few great things. He then went on to relay this to these 40,000 university students. He said this about two women, that three weeks earlier, his church had been notified that Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards had both been killed in Cameroon. Now, Ruby was over 80. She was single all of her life, and she poured it out for one great thing, to make Jesus Christ known among the unreached, the poor, and the sick. Laura was a widow, a medical doctor, pushing 80 years old and serving at Ruby's side in Cameroon. Piper, our pastor, went on to say, the brakes failed, the car went over a cliff, and they were both killed instantly. And I asked my people, was that a tragedy? Two lives driven by one great vision spent in unheralded service to the perishing poor for the glory of Jesus Christ two decades after almost all the American counterparts have retired to throw their lives away on trifles in Florida or New Mexico. No, that was not a tragedy. That is a glory. And then Piper made it very clear for the people who had gathered there he said that most people, many people in the crowd, did not want their life to make a difference in that way. They would rather live the American dream than living for Christ Jesus. To have the nice car, the spouse, good home, easy life, retirement, walking along the shore collecting seashells. That's what he said walking along the shore collecting seashells. And then this, quoting, The American dream, come to the end of your life, your one and only life, and let the last great work before you, before you give an account to Creator be, I collected shells. See my collection? He said that would be a tragedy. And to that I would agree. Is it that we want to come before our Lord and Savior to give an account of our life? And we will. It is said that we will give an account of our life. And we want the last great thing that we have done to say, look at my collection. Look at my knickknacks on my shelf. Is that what we really want in our lives? Or is it to live a life unto Christ Jesus. You see, all things of this world will perish. Everything, including the seashells. But 
Only what's done for Christ will last. So as you can tell already, this is not a typical Christmassy sermon, is it? This is about the new year and a new opportunity that we have before us, and one with urgency. I felt extremely urgent in preparing for this message and excited in preparing for this message. Living for Christ to the very last breath. To the very last. Look, this should be the all-consuming passion in our life. Certainly for the Apostle Paul, that was his passion, right? Living for Christ Jesus. It was his through line that carried him through the good times and the bad. And he went through many difficult hardships in his life. This is Paul who said that he presses on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this day, this year, let us all press on for that upward call of living for Christ Jesus to the very end. So today, as we learn what it means to live for Christ Jesus, we will learn from Scripture, we will learn from Paul. He wrote three basic areas that we're going to cover today. Advancing the gospel, proclaiming Christ, and then living for Christ. So advancing the gospel, proclaiming Christ, and living for Christ. Let's go to our reading in Philippians chapter, 12, chapter 1, starting verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So let me give you a little context here, okay? So Paul is in prison in Rome, and ultimately he's going to die there, and we believe that he was beheaded there in Rome. So he's writing from prison. And now he writes to this church uh, of Philippi, or we would say to the Philippians, this church in Philippi. Now, if you want to find out how this church was founded, you can read Acts chapter 16. You see, Paul and Silas had gone on a missionary journey. And then one night, there was a vision to go to Macedonia, in which Philippi is located. And there they met a woman named Lydia. And her heart was open to the Lord, and she became a Christian. It was beautiful. But there was also this slave girl that ended up following Paul around and was just a huge annoyance. So he casts a demon spirit out of her. But this made her owner very unhappy because now he couldn't make money off this slave girl. So what does he do? He sees and drags Paul and Silas, goes to the authorities, and there they were beaten by the crowd with wooden sticks. And when I say wooden sticks, I don't mean just little twigs. These were heavy sticks that would truly do them physical harm. So they're beaten, and then they're taken to jail, and their feet are put in stocks. So what would you do if you've just been beaten and put in stocks? Well, Paul and Silas prayed and sang. And that's what they did in jail. And then right around midnight, huge earthquake. And everybody, all the doors, everything's open so all the prisoners could escape. And the jailer is so afraid because all the prisoners are escaping that he's going to lose his life. They say, don't do that. And the jailer and his household become converted that night. So, the next morning, the authorities found out that Paul was a Roman citizen. Not good to imprison a Roman citizen or beat them. So they let him go. That's how the church of Philippi was founded. Now, 
would you ever read a book on how to plant a church and say, follow these things? You wouldn't, would you? Pretty tough road to follow. And now, full circle, Paul's back in prison. And so he's writing to this church in Philippi. And he's also guarded by the imperial guards round the clock. Now, these guards were elite. They were hand-picked. They got special pay. But one of their duties that they didn't like was to guard imperial prisoners. And they were chained to Paul, or Paul was chained to them, 24 hours a day, six-hour shifts. Okay, look. If you were in those circumstances, right, you founded the church, you went through all of that, and Paul went through even more, and now you're in prison again, what would you do? A lot of us would give up, wouldn't they? I mean, sit there, you become inward, look downward, become depressed, but not Paul. He saw this as an opportunity, as an opportunity to witness Look, do the math. Six-hour shifts, four guards a day. That's 28 guards a week, over 100 a month. He's witnessing to people, and they are, dare I say, a captive audience. This is what he did. So this is why he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, and there were 9,000 guards, by the way, the whole imperial guard, and to all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. By witnessing to the guards, day in, day out, some became saved. Some came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, who suffered, died, and rose again for their sins, and in Him they are forgiven. In Him they are restored to the one true God. And He did this with the elite guards. And He did it in Rome. You have to understand how important Rome was. Rome was the first city in history to reach over a million people. At that time, Rome was the largest city in the world, and it had the most power in the world. So now, if you're witnessing to the guards, and then some of the people in political power, think of the impact that would have. They say all roads lead to Rome. All roads also lead out of Rome. This is what Paul was witnessing to. And this is why he could send say at the uh, end of the letter, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. There were converted Christians in Caesar's household. That would be like finding true Christians in the White House, wouldn't it? Yeah, right? You get that. So that's why he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Look, from the outside point of view, Paul's life was a failure. He had been a high-ranking Israelite, an Israelite of Israelites, a Jew of Jews. And then he became a Christian, shunned by the Jews, and now he was in prison. But Paul didn't see it that way. He said, for Paul, in essence, for Paul, everything that had brought him to that place in prison was for the sake of the gospel. And it was worth it even if one person came to know Christ Jesus. So here's the question for you this day, this new year. What if your whole life was for the advance of the gospel. What would that mean? What would that change in your life if your life was truly for the advance of the gospel? 
You know, quite frankly, we don't know when our last day will be. And as sobering as it is, someone in this room, it could be their last year. Don't know that. You see, kids, right, always think that they're going to live forever. Now, we know we're not going to live forever, but sometimes we take our faith like we're going to not die. I, I mean, yeah, I, I get it, right? We will live forever. But we don't take that urgency here on earth. See, what if your whole life was for the advance of the gospel and this was your last year? What urgency would you have? Pastor John Harper had a great, great urgency on the very last day of his life. I don't know if any of you know that name, Pastor John Harper. He was on the Titanic, the unsinkable ship, right? So as the water began to submerge the ship, he was heard shouting to this, Women, children, and the unsaved into the lifeboats. Now isn't that amazing? To yell out, women, children, and the unsaved into the lifeboats. Because if the unsaved died, they were destined to eternal torment. So he wanted the unsaved to go. So up until the last moment of the ship's sinking, he pleaded for people to accept Jesus Christ and the gospel. And even after the ship sunk, he was in the water fighting hypothermia. He would go from person to person, from boat to boat, from wherever they were, and plead for them to know Christ Jesus and the gospel. The invitation is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So he went up to one man and he had pleaded that and the man rejected. And a little while later, Pastor Harper came back and pleaded with him, believe in the Lord Jesus and thou shall be saved. And the man accepted Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. And shortly after, Pastor Harper succumbed to hypothermia. Four years after the fact, at some invitation, the man recounted to a group that he was the last convert of John Harper. You see, you don't know when your last day is. And you don't know who will be your last convert. You just don't know. It could be the person behind the deli counter or at the gas station, or the person who comes to fix a dishwasher or maybe clean the rugs or something like that. It could be a stranger just passing by on the street. You don't know. But there's that urgency. Because on this earth, we really won't live forever. And so we can't take our faith for granted in that regard. But some of you might say, okay, but I'm not that bold, right? Look, I didn't start off bold either. It's as I've grown in my faith that I have become more bold. And as I've grown in my faith, it is because I am compelled by Jesus Christ and the gospel. Harper was compelled by the gospel. It wasn't just this thing that like, oh yeah, the gospel. No, it's like a reality of the gospel. And when it becomes truly real in your heart, then the urgency comes, then the boldness comes, and boldness encourages others to be bold. That's how it works. One step at a time. Paul wrote this, verse 14, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Let this be a year of being fearless in the Lord. So Paul lived for advancing the gospel. He lived for proclaiming Christ. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ out of 
from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So the situation is Paul's in prison, and he is preaching and teaching as much as he can to whoever is there with him, writing his letters. And there are other pastors in Rome. The church of Rome had been founded before Paul became a prisoner. And, and they're not getting as much attention because the Apostle Paul is in town. And so there's a little bit of ego involved in this. Rivalry, envy. Now, they are not preaching false doctrine. Had they been teaching and preaching false doctrine, Paul would have been on them quickly. If you have any doubt about that, read his letter to the Galatians. So it's not about false teaching, but it's about the ego that drives them. Some of the other pastors there, they're preaching lovingly and sincerely, probably even referring back to Paul as an example. Now, when I say preaching lovingly and sincerely, that does not mean a watered-down preaching or teaching. They are still preaching Christ and Him crucified. Now, Paul could have easily pitted both groups, right? He says, you know, you got people who are preaching out of envy. You got people who are preaching out of love. Let's have them fight against each other. But he doesn't do that. And Paul's not worried about himself. As long as they are preaching Christ with no false doctrine, Paul basically says, who cares? It's not about me. My aim is to always glorify Christ. Verse 18, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. We have a ministerial in town, right? You know this. And today I'm no longer president. Woohoo! <laughs> well, it was a lot more work than I thought it would be. But, <laughs> but we have a wide group of pastors in town, don't we? We have a couple Lutherans, we've got Baptists, non denominational. We've got non-denominational Baptists, and we've got Pentecostal, right? There's a whole spectrum in here. But we are unified in Christ Jesus. And there's no worry about, oh, well, their church is so much bigger than our church and all of that. No, we, all, we want all the churches to be filled, right? There's not the envy or rivalry that goes on. And what keeps us together is that Christ Jesus is the main thing. The main thing is that the main thing is always the main thing. And Christ Jesus and his gospel are the main thing. Say that fast five times. But you understand that, right? When Christ Jesus and his word, him crucified, is the main thing, we stand united together, and we are bolder in our witness together than apart. So Paul says, as long as Christ is crucified, it, Jesus Christ and him crucified is proclaimed, we can rejoice. And the true joy we have as believers, as a church, is Christ Jesus and him crucified, it's front and center. Front and center all the time that he is proclaimed. So Paul lived for the advancing of gospel. He lived for proclaiming Christ. And he lived living for Christ. Verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, Jesus Christ, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now and as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die 
is gain. So pastor and commentator, Kent Hughes, he recounts the passing of a beloved member of his church who was a physician and an elder. So this man had to go in for some work on a stent in his heart. And the procedure was very invasive when they were doing it uh, quite a few years ago. And the surgeon came out and he came to the family and he said they had to stop because there had been so much bleeding and the family should go into the room because the surgeon wasn't sure if the man would make it through the night. So all the children, they rushed to the bedside and they were gathered there and obviously weeping, saying their goodbyes. And the man, his name's Andrew, he had just come out, out from under anesthesia. He was in intense pain and unable to speak, but he noticed he was making a, a motion with his finger. And they realized he wanted to write something. And so they gave him a pen and a piece of paper. And very intensely, with a lot of deliberation, one, one word per line, he said this, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then at the very bottom, taking a minute to write it, he wrote, hallelujah. And then he spoke with great effort, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This is probably the best known verse in all of the letter to Philippians. What does that actually mean? Let's go to it a little bit. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. And that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. What he's saying is that while he's living here on this earth, he is to live for Christ. And the fruitful labor is proclaiming Christ. Sharing the gospel. The fruitful labor is being a disciple and making disciples. That's his purpose. That's his joy. And yet, even Paul, who had gone through as many hardships as anyone would ever actually not want to go through, there were days, I'm sure, he, was, he wanted just to die and to be with Christ in heaven. And I'm going to guess a lot of us have had that same feeling. And yet, and yet, Paul had work to do before the Lord took him home. You and I have work to do before the Lord takes us home. And this means that if we live for Christ, there has to be a reprioritization in our life. To live for Christ means a reprioritization in our lives. Look, I know I've talked about fishing, right? I like to go fishing. How many times have I gone fishing since I've been in Arizona? Zero, yes. And I've gotten invitations too. And I, believe me, I still want to go fishing. Right? And yet, in the priority of my life, that's lower. I've had to stop doing some things that I like doing or want to do for living for Christ. Because of living for Christ, there is a priority in my life. And it didn't start off that way. It has been growing throughout. You know, I've told you this before. The picture of me, my spiritual picture, is being a, of a mule being dragged along by God. 
and I put in my feet, and then I go, and he pulls, and I put in my feet. I just go a little faster now. But it is a reprioritization in my life. And there are things that I have to die to in order to live for Christ. So this year, what's the reprioritization in your life? And this is not me. This is not just Paul. This is God speaking. This is what Jesus told his disciples from our gospel reading. Truly, truly, I say to you. That's amen, amen, which means this is really important. Amen, amen, I say to you. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. We are to die to the things that are of this world. We are to die to the love of the things that perish and live for Christ. So Paul writes this, verse 25. He says, convinced of this. He's not like, well, you know, I thought it over and it seemed like a good idea. It's not that at all. He says, I am convinced of this. The reality of who Jesus is and the gospel. He says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. For your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you. Okay, so this year, this new day, new year, really one main question for you. Are you willing to be mastered? Are you willing to be mastered by Christ Jesus and his gospel. In other words, to live for Christ. If you are willing for that, there are some things you must do. One, you need to really be in his word. You cannot be mastered by him apart from his word. Plain and simple. The more you're in his word, the more you will be mastered by him. But this is not all on your own effort. It also means that it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Your boldness will only come through the power of the Holy Spirit, giving you a greater ever understanding and surety or certainty of the gospel. And here is it. You will have to die to some things in your life and reprioritize other things in following and serving Jesus. Brothers and sisters, look, this is the call. This is the call that Christ Jesus has given to each and every one of us. Follow him. To have him be your light. To have him lead you on in all things. Because ultimately, in serving him, there is joy, even when there is hardship. There's jubilation, even in difficulty. There is Christ Jesus and him alone. And to that, we all write our hallelujahs. Amen? Amen.